focus our gathering today and say a few things about Cody Institute and our partnership with Pathy Fellowship and Pathy Foundation. Eileen, the mic is yours. Thanks so much. Actually, maybe I will ask Jessica if she would like to start with the land acknowledgement, and then I'll say a few words right after Jessica. Please go ahead. Thanks, Eileen. So we'd like to start off this morning by acknowledging that we are in the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The territory of Nova Scotia is covered under the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, which was signed by the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people in 1725 with the British Crown. The treaty did not surrender the territory or the land, but instead established Indigenous title in Nova Scotia and recognized the ongoing relations between nations. We'd like to recognize the land and its history in this way, and the people. And the people. And the people. Anti-colonialism and anti-oppression. We are all treaty people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, and it's a pleasure to have you here today. And welcome, everybody. And as uh, Dagafi pointed out already today, um, we're sitting here in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, which is in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And um, we're all we're always very grateful um, to be here um, and to be um, welcomed to this land by the Mi'kma'ki. Um, but I have to say, I was not expecting to have the biggest snow in two decades, uh, snowstorm in two decades here. And so we're a little bit under <laughs> a little bit under the uh, under the snow at the moment, and we've, as a result, had to switch this program to just being um, an online program. Otherwise, we would have had uh, we would have been enjoying some Ethiopian coffee um, and having a combination of on online and in person. But um, in addition to um, to honoring um, the Mi'kma'ki um, people, I also want to acknowledge that. Um, the theme uh, of 2024's Black History Month, which is what's happening right now, is Black Excellence, a Heritage to Celebrate and a Future to Build. Black History Month here in Canada symbolizes the significant past and present contributions of Black people in Canada, um, many who have, who, of whom who have come from, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and they've contributed in such a great way, but they're also... Um, focused on nurturing future opportunities and leaders um, that we um, need to celebrate and honor in our own country here. So this is something that is also deeply important to us at Cody and beyond. Um, so we're celebrating that this month. And in addition to that, um, February 4th to 10th is International Development Week here in Canada. And we celebrate this week by reflecting on Canada's role in development and in humanitarian assistance around the world. This year, um, as part of that, um, that acknowledgement, we're especially highlighting the key role of youth in shaping the future. Um, International Development Week also emphasizes the voices of, uh, of people from developing countries and communities of interest in international development as well as the two-spirited LGBTQ plus community, and of course, um, gender equality in the women of women and girls. Um, so a very important week of acknowledging work that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. This work um, that we're engaged in is both local and global, and it's pivotal to securing sustainable development for us all. And in Canada, like other countries, we are committed to the sustainable development goals. What happens in other parts of the world, both good and bad, increasingly also has a direct impact on our communities here at home in Canada and vice versa. So for us, um, it's imperative that we continue to strive for what Reverend Dr. Moses Cody called a full and abundant life for all. And there's nobody better to lead us into that work than the incredible youth leaders who are not just leaders of tomorrow, but they're leaders of right now, of today. Um, and for decades, Cody Institute has uh, prioritized youth leadership in its work, and it will continue to do so with programs that are focused on youth employment, on community engagement, and working with a variety of government foundations and civil society partners. And today, in partnership with the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, we're really pleased to introduce you to five exceptional individuals 
who were selected for the prestigious Pathy Foundation Fellowship this year. The fellowship is an incredibly generous and groundbreaking initiative of Mr. Lawrence Pathy and the found family, Pathy Family Foundation based out of Montreal. And I know that many of the foundation and family members have, um, are joining us today. Uh, Mr. Pathy has been long interested in supporting leadership excellence and has been um, specifically supporting this program managed by Cody Institute since 2014, 2015. For this program, Pathy Fellows work on an initiative of their choosing over the course of a year and ensure that it's a community-driven initiative. Eligible candidates are new graduates coming from six universities. That is Queen's University, University of Ottawa, Carleton University, McGill University, Bishop's University, and St. FX, where Cody is located. The five individuals you are about to hear from today are part of a cohort of nine this year, and the other four fellows um, also deserve some acknowledgement. They're conducting projects here in Canada. Fanta Lee is working on Black student retention and anti-discrimination in higher education. Mael Weber is working on comprehensive sexual and health education. Aubrey Apps is working on consent culture education with young athletes. And Lila Al-Fadli is working on anti-human trafficking with Muslim women. I'm really hoping to have an opportunity of introducing those four individuals to you at a later date. I'd like to really thank the Pathy Foundation Board and the team for your support in such an important initiative. And I'd also like to thank Jennifer Sloot today and her team for their generous collaboration on today's International Development Week event. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn back to Degafi so we can really hear from these amazing uh, five uh, young leaders of today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. The uh, modern origin of development had its roots in post-World War II period as part of the larger plan to prevent the spreading of the former Soviet Union and communism, but also advance the interest of the U.S. and its allies. Prior to Second World War II, Poverty in the global south was not concern of the north. During the colonial era, in fact, poverty was understood more on racial terms, according to the anthropologist Arturo Escobar. In colonial times, the concern was poverty, conditioned by the belief that even if the natives could be somewhat enlightened by the presence of the colonizer, not much could be done about their poverty because their economic development was pointless. The natives' capacity for science and technology, the basis for economic progress, was seen as nil. So this kind of uh, international development oversight or, or understanding prior to Second World War was the very foundation of the international development related to international relation, uh, the, the issue of uh, national interest of governments and security interest of government. But that has diversified, that has changed over the last couple of decades. Beyond the government-oriented policy frameworks, uh, philanthropy has really injected a new energy, a new approach, and a new way of looking at international development. As Eileen mentioned, their choosing these young men and women are working in areas of their choosing and also community-based initiatives. So I am privileged and honored to introduce uh, today's uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, I will begin from East because it's much further from me and being further, if, is, if it is any advantage, I will start with uh, our colleague and our um, uh, the person who is working on the ground in Pakistan. Sara Mea Kaba is a Canadian-Pakistani educator and multidisciplinary artist. Her art bridges dance, poetry, spoken word, and singing. And she has passion for using the arts for social change. She is currently based in Pakistan and heading Awaz, an initiative that is bringing mental health and performing arts program across a network 
of slum schools and low-income settings across Islamabad and Hunza. Additionally, she is spearheading Pakistan's first winter renegade program that will use sport as an avenue for women's empowerment, mental health and training, and positive youth development as well. So far, she has delivered the AWAS program to over 80 participants and educators. So before, uh, without any further ado, I will uh, invite Sarah Maya Kaba to present her work and I will introduce the next panelist uh, once Sarah is, has completed her presentation. Sarah? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much, Degafi. Um, thank you all for joining. It's lovely to be here and speak to all of you um, all the way from Pakistan. So my initiative is kind of all over the place. It started up in Hunza in northern Pakistan. And over there, I was working with a community-based school um, with approximately 40 students and 20 educators. Um, and we were working in tandem to create a mental health and performing arts curriculum for them. Uh, in November, I moved to Islamabad. And here I'm working with a slum-based school network. So these are students who... Um, most of their basic needs often aren't met. They're living in tiny one room houses. Many of them are fortified tents. Um, and there's a school system that serves 4,600 such children here. So I'm partnered with them. Um, I'm also in the process of creating some strategic partnerships with higher education institutions um, across Karachi and Islamabad. See how we can incorporate mental health training into uh, teacher education programs and bachelor of ed programs. Um, and then hopefully later this week, I will leave for Chitral, which is a region up north um, in kind of mountainous village communities to start a vignette and kind of winter sports and mental health education program for about a week, which I'm super, super excited for. Okay, our... Our next speaker is Sophie McFarty, McCavery, and is a Pathy Foundation fellow currently supporting a Tingit Women's Goat Cooperative in Chilanga, Malawi. She has a passion for feminist agroecology and loves exploring the intersectionality involved in our food systems. Sophie studied environmental science and sustainable agriculture and food systems. Her dream is to one day have her own small scale farm for textiles, dyes, and foods. Sophie draws much inspiration from her current community work. The Women's Goat Cooperative consists of 21 women and 10 goats. Members gather regularly to learn about sustainable goat management practices that harness their potential for soil regeneration, whilst also exploring the many ways this common livestock can be used to support livelihoods. The cooperative has been working hard and will soon be designing their very own electric fence, preparing for the arrival of baby goats and learning how to milk the goats for cheese and soap. Sophie? Hello. Thank you, Degafi, for introducing me. I think my introduction kind of um, said it all, but I'll, I'll re recap. So I'm Sophie. I'm working in Chalanga, Malawi, which is in the central region, um, a very arid region um, used for agriculture. And I'm working with an organization called Transformative Praxis. And through that organization, they have a campus. Um, I've been working with a women's goat cooperative that was created in October. And um, since October, we've done many steps to get um, the cooperative off the ground. So we built a shelter, the women got the goats, we created a micro loan program because we've been looking into uh, livelihoods and how um, agroecology and agriculture ties directly into livelihoods, especially um, when we work with small scale farmers. And so from there, um, we're looking on expanding and for the next part of my project, um, well, initiative, we're focusing on knowledge transfer and building relationships between different organizations in Malawi so that um, once my time is up, the cooperative will have strong ties with other 
um, agroecological um, organizations that can help build um, the initiative to not only just focus on goats, but to also um, focus on the holistic um, agricultural practices that have to do with um, uh, sustainable agriculture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Sophie, just touch a very interesting two keywords, knowledge transfer and building relationship. Thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker is Anthony Igahmoye, is a recent graduate from Queen's University Smith School of Business in Kingston, Ontario, with a master's in entrepreneurship and innovation. Anthony also possesses an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and upon graduation spent four years as an electric vehicle design and manufacturing company specializing in building, testing and deploying energy saving devices for trucks and buses. His current initiative through the Pathy Fellowship centers around transforming traditional rickshaws into electric vehicles to provide mobile inf infrastructure that can also be used as a mini mobile grids to power communities. This innovative approach not only helps rickshaw drivers save money, but also powers their homes, fostering access to digital services for themselves and their families when the rickshaw is not used in transporting people. Anthony's vision is to create a positive impact by enabling rickshaw drivers to support their families. He hopes that this initiative will contribute to sustainable and community-focused solutions centered around green energy, encouraging low-income households and African communities to participate in climate and clean energy solution. Here is Anthony's quote. My journey reflects a commitment to combining technical expertise with social innovation for a brighter and more connected future through a laser focused approach with emerging communities as a pioneer partner. Anthony? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. That was, uh, wow, I was reading, I was like, wow, so. So I can write like that. <laughs> uh, uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to connect and share my story, what I'm working on. And uh, the Gaofi, you couldn't have said it any better. And at the part of this is we're basically leveraging te technology that already exists today. And, and I'm going to use vehicles that we might be more familiar with like a lot of us uh might be familiar with the vehicle called tesla uh, and and most, some of us have it some of us have people who have it in this part of the world and the technology that we're using for this low income low income communities is not so different from the one that tesla is using as well and the goal is like i mentioned social innovation and we ask ourselves our question how can we make these technologies, which are supposed to save money for people who are middle class and rich, also available to people who are low income? And you know, we decided to target a very specific segment of the 600 million people that potentially have no access to electricity in Africa today. And we targeted the rickshaw drivers because we have an infrastructure to build upon. And Therefore, we don't have to, there is no, there, there's not a lot of upfront cost in terms of the um, conversion process. So instead of having solar panels and batteries, we take all that off and then we just use uh, their assets, which is their rickshaws. And it's one of the most valuable piece of assets to them because that's how they get their money to feed their families. And we make that a sustainable green energy solution that can power homes. Uh, providing digital access to them and saving them on their day-to-day -day operations, which is uh, trans moving goods and services from one place to another. And so we hope to start a catalytic journey, not only from rickshaws, but we want to span this into an entire green and clean energy solutions from the rickshaw all the way to trucks and buses, which is where I got my initial electric vehicle experience from. And I'm excited to share more about that and uh, happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anthony. Uh, our next speaker is Jacqueline Tomadic. Is a recent recent bachelor of health science graduate from university who focused her studies in global and population health. Her Pathy Fellowship Initiative strives to promote reproductive health among young women living in Kilimanjaro region of Tanzania through accessibility of sustainable health care resources, services, education, and empowerment programs. This initiative will collaborate with community stakeholders to build capacity and skills to address the burden of women's reproductive health issues, focusing on menstrual health and hygiene for girls in school and adolescent contraception. The project takes a youth-led, asset-based, community-driven approach to building an adaptable workshop framework informed by the lived experiences of community members with plans to empower girls with the skills to facilitate their own workshop and to sew their own reusable parts using local materials. Jacqueline hopes that this initiative will contribute towards raising awareness and body literacy, promote positive attitude towards and amongst all people who menstruate and empower women and girls to live their periods safely and with dignity. Here's a quotation from Jacqueline. I strongly believe that no woman should ever feel limited by any aspect of her body and period, whether it be from obstacles such as a social stigmatization, academic or employment absenteeism and discontinuation product accessibility, economic constraint, self-esteem, and confidence, and beyond. Jacqueline? The mic thank is yours. You. Oh, thank you so much, Degavi, for that wonderful introduction. And hello to everyone on the panel. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge that I am on the land of Maasai and Chaga tribes in Moshi, Tanzania, and uh, acknowledge all of the wonderful people I've been able to work with uh, thus far. Um, so as Dagafi explained, my initiative is currently working to address reproductive health issues among young women in the Kilimanjaro region. And we are doing that by um, tackling three main pillars. The first one is education and destigmatization. The second one is product accessibility or sustainable product accessibility um, and healthcare services. And the third one is research and informed next steps. Um, and so the research side of it is um, conducting an intervention addressing um, the rise in unwanted or unplanned pregnancies amongst adolescent girls and the barriers that they faced um, in family planning um, using a mobile platform enabled intervention. Uh, and this is partnered with Pomoja Tunuweza Women's Center here in Moshi, Tanzania. Um, so as Degafi mentioned, the goal is to use a youth led and community owned approach to create a workshop framework that is adaptable and transferable to um, different institutions and organizations, primarily in schools to uh, tackle the issue of school absenteeism and uh, discontinuation among uh, young women. Um, and also to explore different topics in reproductive health, such as um, sexual reproductive health, as well as um, sexually transmitted diseases. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, our next speaker is Danny Mahirane, is a graduate of social science from University of Ottawa, specializing in international development and globalization. Presently, she resides in Kiak. Kiaka's second refugee settlement camp in Uganda. Throughout her academic journey, Dani's focus has been on comprehending community development and rehabilitation through hands-on approaches, as well as fostering peace building. This is my favorite part. For her Pathy Fellowship, Dani initiated Sasa RDC program aimed at increasing awareness about early pregnancies and empowering underage mothers in Kiaka. Second, increasing awareness about uh, the objective to enable young mothers to attain self-sufficiency, contribute uh, to the community, and combat the discrimination and the stigma faced by girls with pregnancy out of wedlock. The primary goal of this initiative include identifying practical solutions 
offering support to pregnant girls and young mothers and promoting awareness of sexual reproductive health and rights. Initially, the project's emphasis was on vocational training, was to equip young girls with skills for self-sufficiency. Now, Danny's focus has expanded to include integrating income generating activities to address the needs of these girls as they pursue vocational skill training utilizing the available resources in the refugee camp. Danny? Hello, Degafe and everyone. Thank you very much. That was a great introduction. Um, my name is Dani, as uh, I'm introduced already. Uh, my initiative is Sasa RDC Initiative, and we are currently in Chaka. It's a refugee settlement. And our goal is mainly to try to um, raise awareness, try to bring girls co-op as earlier when we were trying to write this initiative. Um, when we reached at, at Pathy Fellowship, like at Code Institute, we all had our plans. We all had uh, some sort of schedules that we had to follow, but reaching there, we realized the issue might have been beyond what we expected. And that's why we ended up transforming and we were ready to be challenged by the on-ground realities. And as we told you earlier about where I am, it's a refugee settlement, actually currently uh, hosting 125,000 refugees and mainly from DRC and I think Democratic Republic of Congo because DRC could mean a lot. Uh, and as you all know, there is an ongoing conflict or war since 1996 and uh, over 10 million deaths already and uh, 6 million women raped. And with that, right now, we are trying to do what uh, we are trying to do as much as we can, which is trying to assist um, refugee women where I grew up because I was once a refugee. And now I think it's time for me to give back to the community who gave everything, um, even though they didn't have him they didn't have an, enough and i'm actually very happy to speak to you today and even introduce you to what we do or what's our day today even trying to challenge our daily realities and even changing narratives because it's all about perspectives and what we see and what we think it is thank you very much Thank you, Danny. Um, for our listeners, if you're really discouraged about the state of the world uh, over the last number of years and, and war and conflict and displacement, all those kind of things, this is a place for you to have an active hope, active hope that people are actually working to change the situation in, in the ground. As, as you have heard already, five of our fellows one is working in an environment, which is a critical issue given the climate emergency. Danny is working in refugee issues. Uh, health of women is another aspect we covered. Healing through arts and creative imagination. And dealing with trauma and sustainable agriculture. agriculture. There is no better place to be today than listening to these young uh, professionals changing their communities and working with the community. And most importantly, they are building relationship, good relationship, healthy relationship, and we are very grateful for your work. Now, uh, before we uh, engage each one of you in in a in a, some kind of formal discussion, I would like to put out some general question, uh, and then we will uh, engage with our audience, uh, coming questions from them. Um, Danny, you at the end you mentioned ultimately it's about changing narratives, uh, your development work, and I, I suppose that applies to all of you. Can you or anyone from the panelists uh, discuss the issue of when you say you are changing narratives? What do you mean? What is happening on the ground? What practical work is taking place in that regard? Oh, thank you very much for this question. Um, actually, changing narratives, it's a matter of knowing what we do and how we see things. For example, like um, if you go right now on Google, I think most of you are using devices or cell phone or smartphones. Uh, if you go right now on Google and you, you try to click or type poverty in Africa, children dying, ongoing war, internal conflicts, you'll see it all. 
But at the same time, we think we have the solutions, like going to development school. Um, I thought I'm going there to learn something. And at the same time, I'm going to bring the solutions because we are in developing countries and sometimes we try to find the solutions. But with that, I realized I was wrong because I am not going to bring the solution and I am not helping, but I'm here to learn because we have to first unlearn what we thought we knew in order to learn. We have to be open to learn. And the change does not come from outside because if the change was supposed to come from outside, uh, over 40 years of aid in Africa or in 54 African countries, I think by now we would have been more developed than Canada. So with this happening, I think the solution should come from within. And that's why we are trying to um, host like uh, community owned initiatives instead of just community driven. I love community driven, but I think community owned brings more accountability. It's not just from the person bringing this initiative or thinking of any entrepreneur skill or um, initiative, but it's most of the community owning it and let the solutions come from the community because currently I work with women and we try to run appreciative inquiry and we had to learn from them. What are the solution? What are the solutions? And what do you think is the problem? Because growing up here, I thought, okay, it's just women are being uh, violated. Our rights are not being really, uh, you know, are not being um, respected. But looking now as an adult, I think there is more beyond just rights. There is more beyond uh, women being disrespected. It's all about what we see and what how we try to act upon it or we try to just abandon it and let it go and think somebody will come from somewhere to fix it when the solution is us. So that's what I'm trying to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, the topic of our actually conversation today is challenging hegemony in international development. I think what you have outlined actually matches to the topic. Is there anyone who wants to add uh, what Danny said from your personal experience, from your own initiative? I think. We have lived through a number of decades. Most of, particularly at the African continent, has been projectized. Everybody has a project in Africa, and our assumption is that projects will ultimately save Africa. But from what Danny said, uh, the approach has to change. Anyone, anyone wants to comment? You could go ahead, Anthony. Okay. Um... Yeah, thanks, uh, Danny. That's that was a very strong thing. I completely echo that completely. Like, um, one of the questions that I was even asked when we had uh, kind of like a, I guess like a community discussion was, I hope this is not one of those things where you will come in and then you will make you and you will give it to us for almost free because it's a project and then you go away and then later we're stuck with a burden. I hear that a lot. In fact, I think because of that, like I paused for like a week uh, because I had to even evaluate what I was even trying to do. Um, you know, because like you said, the project thing has been commoditized, in, especially in Africa, right? And it's like everybody has a project in, in Africa. And, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, Danny pointed out, which I really echo again, is not community driven, but community owned. And the ownership can usually stem from them solving them solving their own problem and seeing the benefit and tying that to something that they are already doing. And, and that's what what kind of like my approach is, is saying that you're already driving a rickshaw, right? Whether you are, whether I, whether we do this project or not, you will continue in the same state. This is what will continue to happen. Um, but here, you know, based on what the problems that you're facing, these are possible solutions. They can come with those solutions that yes, they've been thinking of that, but maybe there's no finance, maybe there's no resources, or maybe they are not empowered enough to see the benefits. And then when they look at the benefits and how it's like, okay, we're not just doing this for ourselves but we're doing this for our children too. And here are the other benefits that are tied into it. Then they become more involved. And I think that's where the ownership comes from is to say, I own a part of this. This is something that would run whether I am there or not. 
because you're already paying a high price today. And just like Danny said, these women are already paying this high price today in one way or the other. And so having it in such a way that it's not for you, but it is for them helps to really drive the, 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 the point that this is not just another UN whatever kind of project which everyone is doing, but but rather it's a community owned initiative that becomes yours as you involve yourself through it. And in order to do that, you have to very critically understand what they are already looking for and tie that your initiative to it. And so my initiative has shifted over the course because you know i went into a community where they said that we have electricity right so i thought that they didn't have electricity in that community this is a very rural place but they have electricity but we don't have transportation our kids have to walk almost two hours to school something by the time they walk to school is done so now i'm not thinking of rickshaws anymore Although I come with rickshaws but i'm not thinking of rickshaws but i know that the concept from that rickshaw could be applied to ease transportation for them. So that's a different conversation because all they're looking for is like one bus that will take their children from school. They're not looking for transport. They just want one bus that will pick their children from the street at eight and bring them back at three. That's it, done, right? If you give them that, there's, there's no other conversation to be had. And I think a lot of a lot of this projects, people tend to look at it from a very huge, uh, you know, it's got to be a very massive project. But I think looking at this from a very simple, you do this, you get this outcome, really helps to foster engagement in communities. Yes, that's that's it for me. Thank you. Before we go to some of the questions from the audience, I would like to uh, invite Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline, you are working in an area where, as you recognize and acknowledge the land as a Maasai community, and this is largely uh, an area where there is a tourist stereotype, you know, elephants and giraffes are roaming and all those wild things. And for you, particularly working with the Maasai community and building that relationship, what really, what, do, what is your observation from what you knew from the media and what you are working uh, on the ground in building that relationship? Jacqueline? Thanks, Tagafi. Uh, yeah, like you said, there um, are a lot of narratives in um, Moshi, where I'm living with uh, both Chaga and Maasai tribes um, that are perpetuated both from external um, visitors, but then also by the culture here as well. Um, and it's been um, an interesting experience learning how to deconstruct that on an individual level um, because as a white individual coming from Canada with Western biases um, that I'm still continuing to deconstruct every single day, um, the, the narrative that um, is perpetuated here um, is, is that I'm the expert, right? Um, and um, it's really been about decolonizing the approach to inter um, uh, international development and community work here, um, both with myself and within the community. And um, one of the biggest learnings I think that I've had so far was switching from a goal of capacity building to more capacity bridging. Um, initially, I um, had a goal of capacity building. So being able to bring my um, my knowledge um, and work with communities to identify the assets that exist here um, and to empower that community to make their own changes. But I've been learning that um, to take it even a step further from capacity building to capacity bridging, where I'm not the one building the capacity, it's the community that is building their own capacity. Um, and instead, I have been trying to act as a bridge to the resources, to um, the existing assets that they can leverage here in, in Moshi as a community. Um, so 
And to answer your initial question about um, the big tourist presence and the perception of white people or foreigners in Kilimanjaro, um, I think it, it, it starts with the decolonization on a multi-level. So not just in the community, but in institutions on a societal level. Um, and of course, it's it's not really, I can't come in here saying that I have all of the answers on how to do that, um, but it, it does start with um, the asset-based community development, which we're all super familiar with um, through the Cody Institute. Thank you, Chaplin. Um, I, I, was, I was privileged actually to look into the working processes of the PATHI Fellowship and PATHI Foundation from conceptualization of an, an initiative to applying that initiative and building a relationship and appreciating what is already there then starting from they have nothing so we can bring something and and change the dynamics on the ground. I think what is very interesting and very appreciated in the PATHY Fellowship is the initiative doesn't start from they have nothing. It starts from what they have and build on that. And that is what makes it unique. Let me go to Pakistan, uh, to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, can you comment on those uh, questions I have posed to uh, the rest of your colleagues in terms of the relationship building aspect of it. What really surprised you, even though you are familiar with the community in the past, in terms of your own work, in terms of that relationship building, what stands out for you? Sarah? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Lovely. Um, thank you for asking that question. There's a lot to unpack, I think, um, as I kind of sift through my thoughts. Um, one thing that has been so incredible and that I feel so privileged to witness is the strength of the relationships already in the community. Um, just as an example, one of the school systems I'm working with, um, the Balikiran school system, the ones who work within the slum-based uh, community settings, they don't... Um, uh, adhere to any of the national holidays in the country. Um, and so come rain or shine, come even if everybody else in the country is off as they are this week, um, everyone still shows up to school, all of the teachers. Um, and I had a conversation with one of them and they were talking about how um, they're like, the kids have nowhere else to go. So we show up for them. Um, even though people have their own families and have their own children to take care of. Um, and I think that was interesting for me because coming from someone who's been a part of the education system in the West, um, and then also a little bit here, I haven't seen teachers in any other educational capacity who don't look forward to holidays. Um, so I think just seeing the strength of the commitment and the dedication of community members to other community members has been really exciting and just really special to see. Um, I also think I have been surprised by the sheer amount of creativity that I see in the people around me and not just in the traditional um, sense of art that we tend to relegate creativity to, but I think also just in everyday life. Um, and I'm sure that most of my colleagues on this panel will agree with me in um, seeing how in these settings that we work in that are a little bit more volatile and a little bit more unstable, um, you plan for something and it never ends up working out that way. And so really relying on the community to help support you and finding like back end ways to get things done. Um, if A, B and C don't work, how can we create a D? Um, and so really just seeing the, the creativity, the way that people um, make something out of nothing. There seems no way for something to happen. And then just watching how people come together and mobilize each other to find avenues to get work done and to connect people has been uh, really exciting for me. Let, me. let me stay with you, Sarah, for a, for a few minutes. Um, uh, as as uh, your resource person, I had an opportunity to monitor your activities and work with you and converse with you through your uh, fellowship period. Um, one of the things you mentioned to me was the, the climate emergency, how it affected some of your initiatives. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, so this was interesting for me. I think I had been, uh, so I was in Pakistan during the floods of 2022. And so I 
had the opportunity to kind of witness and be in the midst of all that. And at that point, I was like, oh, this is what climate change is. Um, and then this year, it was interesting because climate change was not just something that came all of a sudden. It was something that, um, so for context, sorry, I'll back up a little bit. I am hoping to run the Pakistan's first ringette initiative. Um, ringette is a, shoot, someone's at the door, sorry. Uh, ringette is a winter sport played predominantly in Western countries across Europe, um, Canada, and the States. It is a women's uh, only in the most forms um, ice sport. And so I'm hoping to uh, work with the community here to kind of um, see if that picks up alongside ice hockey, which is already doing, um, really making great strides here. And uh, the ice just hasn't frozen over at all this year. Um, their ice time usually start in December. We are now in February. Um, and most places have ice. There's only a couple of ice things that have formed at all. Um, so I think that was one. I think other challenges with the weather have come in terms of um, not being able to certain places um, and obviously not because of communication because of um, just the lack of uh, transport and mobility that you're able to have. Um, it's also been difficult to, I think, particularly with climate change, um, pa weather patterns that uh, Indigenous communities here have counted on for generations and generations um, have shifted just in the course of a year. Um, and so just kind of seeing how the li the loss of livelihoods in terms of crops not growing, um, in terms of winds coming later and affecting, again, crops, affecting the stuff that you're able to grow um, has been really tricky and has put a damper <laughs> on uh, some of the things that we were hoping to accomplish. And so even at this point, we're very much operating on a, on a basis in which, okay, well, we'll go, we'll see if there's ice, if there's not ice. Um, and so it's definitely been a lesson, I think, in a different layer of instability um, and also in just the volatility of uh, of planning and of going in with a vision and hoping that it manifests that way. I think it very much doesn't. And so it's just really been a lot of resilience and learning um, that I'm able to take from the communities around me. There you have it. Climate emergency in action uh, and how it affects uh, initiatives around the world is something uh, Sarah witnessed and Sarah shared with us. Before, let me let me go to Sophie before I go to the audience questions. Sophie, you are working in an area of, as you mentioned, um, that sort of uh, bringing technology and, and advanced mechanisms in goat farming and developing uh, cheese and soap and those kind of things. And when people hear that, they might think it, it, like, they might not take it seriously, but you are on the ground you are seeing the impact, you are seeing the relationship between you and uh, your host community. Can you tell us more about what is really happening in terms of that spirit of community coming together, pushing against the odds uh, and making sure that from what they have, they can build something significant, something life changing. Can you share that with us? Yeah, definitely. I can speak a bit to that and I'll touch on what other people have been speaking about as well, because I think it all integrates um, into itself. Um, so when I'm educated in um, sustainable agriculture, so agroecology, so when I arrived and like Anthony had mentioned too, we we arrive and Danny touched on this, we arrive in the, the Pathy Fellowship and we make these plans of what we think are going to happen and then you get to the ground and it, it's, it's quite different. Um, but that's also what what the goal is um, in asset-based community development um, because you want the community to own the initiatives. So um, originally when I got to the ground, I was like, goats are gonna be a great idea. And then a lot of people questioned me on like, why are we gonna farm goats? And then we started having conversations and I think the openness to just that conversation built a lot of trust because at the beginning I was like, okay, if we're not doing goats, that's okay. Like it's not, I don't live here. I'm an outsider. I just arrived. And then it was just decided, yeah, okay, we can go ahead with goats. And then I got a lot of pushback on women farming goats, which I didn't expect. A lot of people laughed at me when they said, they were like, who's gonna, who's gonna herd the goats? And I was like, well, the women are. And then they were like, ha ha, women don't herd goats here. Well, I tell you, we have 21 women right now and they're all herding goats. And they didn't think it was funny. You know, they they were just like, 
yeah, of course we're going to herd goats. Like if you show us how to do it, that's the point. And um, the first meeting we had, there was a big perception and um, this was touched on, I think Jackie also touched on this as being, um, as I am white, working in a community um, where most people aren't white. Obviously, um, there is like this huge power dynamic of perception that comes in that I am still unpacking as well. And I, when we had our first meeting, everyone thought I was just going to buy everyone a goat. And um, I wasn't going to buy everyone a goat. So we we had this discussion of, okay, that's not the plan. Like, how are we going to make this sustainable? Because there's no point of me or anyone giving everyone a goat if we don't know how to raise goats, if we're not going to do it. Um, in a way that's sustainable if we're not going to create on what we have already to make something better and from that my my view and having conversations with the women who were the ones that made their contract who were the ones that knew what they wanted um, and I'm just really there to support them in a lot of ways um, in what I know but also encourage them to go beyond what what they know and, and discover more and share with each other. And I think that's where a lot of the magic has come in, the sharing. So we made a contract at the beginning because there were certain fears. They didn't want to start this initiative and then suddenly it would go away, you know, and, and all that. Um, so we made a contract together. We made sure everyone was accountable. We made sure they were supported in the ways they needed. And it's an ongoing conversation. And I think through that, there was a lot of building of trust. And now there is like a curiosity that could get built from there. So like when we talk about making soap, making cheese, that's totally something we're going to do. That was mentioned, like the, the women are interested. Um, and since they're the ones leading it, um, they get to decide like if they if they keep it, you know, so it's one of those it's a trial and error thing um, that we're going for. Of OK, yeah, we can try new things and we can also bring back traditional knowledge um, that is present in the community. And a lot of people have, but isn't at the forefront of agriculture um, in the community I'm working with. So it's part of doing all that together, the new and the old mixing together to create something that they own and then they continue to do. Um, I was looking in the comments while everyone was talking and Nogat said something. Um, she said, community owned initiatives gives ownership of the community to develop further. And that's the point, I think, with the Pathy Fellowship as well. It's only nine months. And the more, the closer I get to the end, the more I understand that's like not a lot of time, but the more you understand the importance of developing that community ownership because it is theirs to develop further and through realizing that you start to decenter yourself and understand that you are not the center of this even though I don't think any of us went in believing that but because of the things we're taught because of the pre the knowledge we have before going in there is always this this um, view of leadership I've been doing a lot of um workshops actually um, with loads of women in sub-Saharan Africa on um, feminist leadership and bringing how this view of the one leader carrying the group is one that is often flawed and and we need to change our view of that and see how every single person you're interacting with, every relationship you're building is leading what the future is going to be. And it's not all on one person and not one person can be credited for that. So we're just like a small part in the puzzle. So I hope that helped answer your question. Thank you, Sophie. I, I don't know about you, but I am really pumped and I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful hearing um, all five of our panelists what magnificent work they are doing uh, at, at, at the community level. And I think the biggest thing for me is whatever economic or social initiatives we do, ultimately it leads to positive peace sustainable peace, the spirit of community coming together and working together as as peace builder. That's what I look for all the time and I'm greatly encouraged. Now, uh, Brian, uh, I, I, I think we have some number of questions from the audience uh, and I was wondering if you can read or Jenny uh, those questions and uh, our panelists will attempt to answer those questions. Um, our first one is from Kathy Lucking, and she asks, uh, can you explain how we begin to share ownership when our school project has started with our funds and their labor? Ah, okay. Is anyone wants interested in answering that question from the panelists? This is not about me. This is about you guys. Actually, it's a great question. Uh, the first thing before even answering to that question, would love, I would like to know 
uh, how much can your project fund achieve or what is the achievement or what is the length? How far can you go? Because most of our projects have a timeline and we function on limited resources. Talking about that, it's because I am functioning currently on Pathy Fellowship um, funds currently. But at the same time, if you ask me how much have I done by myself, actually, I can't really, um, I can't really guess or even tell you the exact amount because by myself, I can't do enough. So how to share this is at first trying to show the community the value of the initiative itself, because we tend to draw the project. And especially when we come from somewhere else, we tend to think we are going to bring the solutions. But if we bring, if we come with this idea of bringing the solutions to the children, like to, to the situation, we might not be helping because once we close our doors, once our funds dry, we are out of the place. So the best way to share uh, the ownership, it's first by showing them the value or the importance. For example, I could bring you this from my point of view, from my initiative. Currently, uh, we launched the Girls Co-op. Actually, the Girls Co-op, yes, these are my funds from Pathy Fellowship. So what I do, I invest it in the community. Let's say we give girls small businesses, startup. But in order to make them own it, we ask them to refund it back. They're not refunding back to us, but they're funding it to the community. So next time another girl comes with another similar situation, the community will get that amount give it to them because once our school projects are done, we are out of the place. I'll be here by I'll be out of here by May, but I'm praying that I come back so that maybe we could do something more. But at the same time, in order to make the um to make the project owned by the community. It's first by, um, we call it in French, conscientisation. Uh, it's by sensitization, making the community understand the value of this initiative and maybe train more people and even ask for volunteers because sometimes it's just the way we ask people to join us or the way we explain to them our intents sometimes dictates the outcome of what we are doing. So I could say it's to be clear, here is what I'm doing. This is the time frame I have. This is uh, how much time I'm going to spend in this community. But this is the impact that I'm, I'm like, this is the impact I'm willing to see. Uh, these are my goals, but this is what I want to see in the community. So being clear on the first day, not coming uh, like, you know, I'm going to help you this now. Ask them, I need your help to do this. So actually, I, I realized the community are more welcome and willing to help you when you're so open. Actually, I presented myself last time to the Peace Wing, Japan. I needed classrooms, like spaces to uh, to raise awareness, and I didn't have money. So it was very effective. Like, it was cost like efficient, like it was not cost effective to my initiative funds. So I just went to tell them, I'm a student. Actually, I'm broke. And I need the whole, I need it for free because I can't pay it up because I need three days and I don't have the money to pay for it. And actually they told me, come back tomorrow, we'll tell you about it. And right now they even gave me their, their space to use to be used for free without even paying an amount. So it's the community offering it to me. So what if I came, I'll pay for it. What, what about next time? So I could say like, this is a small example uh, that I wanted to bring it up to you based on the community owning the initiative and doing its best to uh, to bring solution to its problems. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Sophie? Yeah, so I love what Danny was saying about changing that relationship of money and, and changing, using, understanding that relationships um, also go a very long way because um, funding monetary funding is a very, very small part of um, community owned initiatives, the community are the central part. So yes, even if you do bring funding at the beginning, you definitely want to work to change that dynamic. But one thing I definitely used at the beginning was saying this is our budget, like this is the budget. Yes, technically, the funding came to me, but this is the budget for this initiative. And the women have complete control over their budget, you know, so that was one way of transferring a lot of power and saying, I'm not the side, you don't come to me to ask me if you can buy a goat. You look at your budget, we learn how to plan together, because I'm not a financial budgeter either, like we were very transparent, we bring people from the community that are good at this. And we together 
have control of our funds. So if that is something that's possible, that transparency and that transferring control of funding is also um, very important because yes, there is a thing where you can see they give labor, you give money. But I think that's just a very black and white dynamic that doesn't represent the whole of most initiatives because initiatives are mainly about the relationships and mainly there are initiatives that will keep on going even after funding because maybe the funding like in my go to, for the goats, the go cooperative, the initial funding was necessary to build structures, things that are very monetarily expensive. But after the the upkeep isn't about the money necessarily, it's about those community ties. It's about creating sustainable financial models that aren't necessarily as big scale as the, the initial funding, but will help sustain the initiative. And by empowering the women to find local ways to sustain this baseline, um, it's been a very big learning experience too for everyone because I'm not a financial, like I said, director, but none of them are either. And so it's been awesome for us to to all work together in a way. And I think that was how it became community owned because it was a transfer of power. And it was also that breaking down of the, I am the leader and I will show you to, okay, no, I don't actually know. We all know together and through our connective, collective knowledge, um, we can figure this out together. So, yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Focusing on intangible values than the actual tangible monetary values, although the monetary values are important in terms of certain aspects of any initiative, but also teasing out those intangible resources is very critical. Uh, let me go to Pakistan, um, uh, Sarah. Uh, how about you in terms of understanding that kind of resource management and uh, challenges in terms of resources, ABCD, how does that apply to your work? Sarah, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I was talking on mute. Um, I think one of the things that I struggled with initially was looking at the, uh, the tensions that come along with um, breadth versus depth. Um, just as an example, uh, one of the school systems I work with, they cater to 4,600 students um, across 11 different schools. Um, my work is only with two of the schools, and that work requires monetary funding and requires the purchasing of um, supplies. And I'm working with a theater-based organization, um, and so guest speakers and other people who are also coming in, um, like Jackie mentioned, the notion of capacity bridging. Um, and I think one of the things that has been a bit of a struggle for me is how do you decide when you're working with such vast organizations where to allocate uh, funding to understanding that um, in each case there are still students, there are still people who will quote unquote miss out on these programs. Um, and I think part of that discussion has, um, and I obviously all of this happens in tandem with community partners, right? This is not something for me to decide as uh, an external figure coming in from the West with funding. Um, but it is an interesting discussion and kind of looking at what we are prioritizing, uh, particularly when it comes to mental health, when it comes to education. These are things that have the potential to have very long-term impacts, um, but in ways that you cannot see in the short term. Um, that or only visible much after my work is done and possibly even the work of the school is done. Um, so that's definitely been a tension. I think it's been one of the interesting learning points um, is learning to prioritize. Um, I think another kind of thing that's, this comes out of, that comes out of this notion is looking at, um, again, I had earlier mentioned this notion of creativity um, and what creative uh, solutions can come up that require the least amount of funding or that um, we can source locally. Um, and so that's also been really helpful, I think, in finding how you can take um, something that is already very finite and then extend its uh, shelf life to say, um, to be something that extends now much past the length of the initiative, but then also the initial players that we had identified to carry this forward. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Jenny, are there any more questions? Let's take a few more questions from the audience. A couple of related questions, so I'm going to try to kind of merge them the best I can. Um, but they're primarily around uh, power structures 
you know, in the context of the different countries or communities that you're working in um, and how to form local relationships with the organizations, with communities in and amongst these power structures. Um, I'll read this one little piece that says, um, how do we change dominant and prevailing power structures and ideologies which are deep rooted in the governance system? And the other piece was more about, you know, building these relationships and trying to navigate your work within these, you know, varying structures in each of the contexts that you're working in. Uh, interesting questions. How do we change prevailing power structures and simultaneously also the question implies how do we build organic relationship, sustainable relationship, given the certain level of impediment the structures may pose. Anyone interested in taking this question? Anthony, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Could you reframe the question, if possible? Well, the question is, as you work your way through with your community, mm -hmm. you are dealing with power structures already in place, already formed there. And yeah. that simultaneously, you are also trying to build organic grassroots relationship. Mm -hmm. Within those two uh, spectrums, how do you sustain your the life uh, expectancy of your initiative and also make impact on the ground how do you how do you deal with the structural part to begin with oh it's a very deep question and it's very interesting because i'm actually facing that right now this exact question you just asked i'm actually facing it right now um and one of the things that you know is coming up right now is how do i deal with the fuel stations because technically quote i'll be taking business away from them right they would be losing so the oil companies uh as you know oil is a very big resource especially in africa everybody has their hands in it all the way to the government and speaking with someone who'd mentioned that yeah they can shut this down before it even begins in fact that's why we're so low radar about it uh because you know initially i wanted to say hey we'll put the swapping station beside the fuel station and I was speaking to like an advisor there who was telling me that you'd be surprised tomorrow morning, they will come and tell you, they'll hit you with like a permit or like a charge or say that you don't have some land use tax or you don't have some something. It's going to come up somewhere, no matter what you have. And that's because the people who own those filling stations, they're a, like a mafia group. Like they, they, they belong to an organization and you're messing around with people's livelihood by coming into this. So this is... The way I have learned to navigate that so far is kind of what um, Sophie was talking about. You just go really small and start it from a bit by bit. This is why this is important to be community owned and it has to improve the lives of the rickshaw drivers and their families. It's very important that this initiative also benefits the families of the rickshaw driver. Hence, we use the rickshaw to power the homes. By doing that, you're not dealing with one rickshaw driver, but you're dealing with a rickshaw driver and your family. And what better motivation for anyone to protect their family, right? Aside any other thing, it might be selfish, it might be self-centered, but they would never ever want to deprive their family of the basic necessities of life. And so having your initiative tie into their lives in that aspect helps to strengthen the resolve from an individual point which in the collectiveness could help to push against the infrastructural point which is the government side because if if it becomes a mass action then there's nothing that anyone can do about it because it's few against the many and so no matter how bad it, it becomes that's what and then on the government side as well I'm slowly exploring how, you know, what are the tax, what are the carbon tax, what are all these kind of things as well to ensure that the rickshaw drivers can get, you know, cheaper energy alternative while being able to support the government. And so we tied a lot of our initiatives into the government's 
And I put air quotes like this because government tends to say, hey, we care about this, we care about that, but they don't necessarily do anything about it. But we try to tie that into their show of um, clean energy and clean tech initiatives so that when we put it back to them in conjunction with having um, the solution tied into family life, it becomes almost difficult for the government to say no and they have the ultimate power anyway to make things happen. So that consolidation or that group of oil magnates who might want to distort this as middlemen become less, they become less of a threat if you have the government who have pledged to climate change and the UN and all those kind of things. And then with a the, with the mass action for the people, you almost like you're, we're not trying to pit them against each other, but we're trying to be on both of their sides so that the middle people who are like the oil uh, and the filling and the fuel people could have less and less power. And that's how I've been able to do it so far. And I, I'm, I have some government people that I communicate with. I have a local bank while at the same time working with like, you know, select like uh, community rickshaw people who know other rickshaw drivers and understand how it benefits their families. So we work with two of them separately so that these middle guys who are really the oil people have become less of a threat. Hopefully that answers the, the question. It's a very godfather way of doing it, but yeah. You did answer it brilliantly. Uh, and uh, I actually put the issue on the spot, how to build a relationship, not just with the community, to build that relationship using the existing laws and frameworks and climate emergency approaches of government to corner the government itself and say, hey, this is precisely what I'm doing. That's very, very creative and brilliant. Eileen, do you want to interject, uh, say something? Uh... No, Dagapi, I just, I see Sarah and Sophie and Danny and Jacqueline all have lots of things to add, so I'll let them speak. Okay, good. Um, are there any more questions, uh, Jenny? You can forward to our uh, panelists and you can share with us. I think before we go to the next question, I know Sarah is anxious to speak on the previous question. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Sarah. Um, I think one thing that I just wanted to add um, is kind of in this discussion of um, ideologies and kind of policies and um, sorry, was there power structures? that are rooted in governance. Uh, one of the things that I'm facing is being an unmarried young woman working in a very patriarchal context. Um, some of the challenges that come along with that. Uh, and then in addition, working um, in the mental health sector, which is still a relatively new concept. Um, I think I very much had to navigate um, ideological struggles um, and things that have seemed uh, inherently contradictory, I think, to each other and have those discussions. Um, and just if I can offer a couple of things that I think can counter some of these narratives, um, one would be that there is resistance in numbers. I think I have been so empowered by the people that I um, have learned about as I'm working on the ground that are already doing such incredible work. Um, and I find that they're also so receptive to take us kind of in um, and allow us to see the work they're doing and partner with us. And so I think there are always people who are already doing good work in all of the domains that we can possibly think of. And so creating those strategic partnerships and just seeing what we can learn from people who have experience on the ground, um, who have done and kind of gone through all of these struggles um, and what we can do to not reinvent the wheel and just take from their successes and challenges and carry forward. Um, I think another one that comes out of this is, even though it's irritating for me, it's just persistence. Um, there are so many no's that you are going to face, I think, in this sort of work. And so um, having to believe that there is a yes kind of behind all of that and finding people who will continually uh, inspire you to find a yes, but then also do the hard work side by side and reaching out and lobbying for you and advocating for you. Um, and then having to, again, particularly as an unmarried woman in this context, having to constantly prove um, that you can do the work that you were setting out to do in a way that, um, in some senses, is more than a male counterpart would have to do. 
Um, because again, this is all so deeply entrenched in the government structures and the cultural um, structures that we kind of we're seeing now post-colonialism, post-colonization. Um, so yeah, I think strategic partnerships, uh, persistence, and um, like I mentioned earlier, resistance and numbers has been really helpful for me. Thank you for letting me add to that. <laughs> Do not take no for an answer. That's what Sarah's message is. Uh, persistence and also the personal struggle of these young men and women face every day because of gender issues, established cultural values, norms for a single and married woman, what the challenges are. So beyond the initiative, they face personal challenges. Um, Jenny, let's go to the we have been into the for an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, we try to wrap up over the next hour. I know this is delicious. We want to keep it going and everybody is tuned in, but at some point we have to wrap it up. So Jenny, can we have a couple of more questions, please? Um, sure, and I know, um, Danny, I see that your hand is up, so maybe we'll throw this question to Danny first, and if she wants to tack on the previous one and kind of move into to the next sure. one. Um, sure. This is about preparation, and this might tie in well to some of the, uh, to talking a bit about the fellowship. So what kind of preparation work was required from you before, uh, before you travel to the place where you're working? Uh, thank you, Jenny, for this question. I think we'll never be prepared enough, especially when you're going back into a community where you don't have uh, the entire idea of how things are working, because you might be from that community. You might share some identity with the people in the community, but people change, community change. So I could say all the preparation, even though I tried to do my best, um, to know my contact person, to even I have relatives actually in my current communities. And uh, even though I prepared myself so much, I realized the community had changed so much in the past 10 years uh, because I left this community as a kid or a teenager, like a little, but at the same time coming back in my twenties, I realized there were many uh, biased ideas or perspectives I had of what was happening. And yes, things have changed based on multiple cultural, like multiple cultures that have come into the into the um, refugee settlement, because there is uh, actually from three or four countries. So with that, I could say pre preparation is mostly try to know who are um, main actors in the community, what type of organizations, like uh, which international or national, even local organization are functioning in that community. Because I could say, once you know the actors, it might be easier for you to delve into the community without any problem. Because coming here, I had the contact person, I had relatives, uh, I knew some international organization working here, but I had no clue of local organization, even refugee organization that had existed or even were brought into the camp or really like a resettlement community. So I could say, first of all, try to inquire because most of the time we think we know, especially when you come from a very uh, respected school among the one percenters. So we feel like we have the answers. I could say it's better that we try to know the main actors in the community because that helps and it helps us prepare in advance and even probably bring up uh, some challenging questions to ourselves and have them answered before they're asked again by community members or those actors in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Jacqueline's hand is up to Gaffey, just sure. in case you can't see it. Yeah, I just wanted to touch really quickly on Danny's comment about never truly being prepared for an initiative like this. Um, and um, I wanted to highlight how important allocating time in the beginning of uh, an initiative to learn ab about um, the existing um, the existing issues that are identified by the community themselves. So you have a preconceived notion of what the issues are that you're aiming to tackle, but you don't truly know exactly um, what those issues are as perceived by the community, because you don't want to come in and fix an issue that you think is going on when there's actually something completely different that the community um, 
or individuals in the community are um, think is a much greater need. So um, we've all been engaging in appreciative inquiry, which is a process of um, gathering knowledge about um, uh, about the issue itself. And for me, in my experience, I've learned so much about um, reproductive health from young girls themselves. I brought um, a bunch of um, papers here just to give you an example of some of the things I've been collecting from girls in workshops about um, the issues that they themselves are experiencing. And so my initiative has changed greatly based off of these um, these results um, from anonymous, um, like girls writing in anonymous responses to, to questions. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to to highlight that from, from Danny about the importance of um, learning as your preparation, because you'll never truly know until you're in the community and you learn from um, those experiencing it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jenny, any more questions? I think we've covered all of the kind of similar topics. If you want to move into uh, the closing part, that'd be great. Sure. Um, let, let, let me ask all of you, uh, in terms of international development work, usually the way it works is there is a template, uh, a design by the funder agency, a government agency, usually what is expected, how the process goes, how it is evaluated, how it's monitored, so on and so forth. I want you to tell me your beyond that kind of evaluation, beyond that kind of measuring impact, since you have been there, what kind of day-to-day -day things, difference you are seeing that changed people's perceptions and they are grateful for working with you, that daily, everyday, what we call in peace building, everyday peace indicators. Can you can you share with me that over the last few months you have been on the ground and you looked at people and say, hey, I can go to bed feeling good about my work. I I made a difference. And and how do you know you have made a difference, a positive difference, constructive difference? I want all of you to reflect on that. I, I don't want you to get into the mechanical evaluation methodology or evaluation processes, but I just want you your own observation in that regard. Anyone? There's lots of hands up. Let's go with Danny. Danny, go ahead. First hand I see. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, because this is a really great question. Um, I could say, first of all, like, uh, we might have already a timeline that we have to respect and some achievements or some, um, goals that we reach out because we were sent into the community. We requested for help to come into our own communities or some communities of our choice. But at the same time, I could say the greatest achievement, it's not about what you achieve in a day a week or a month, I could say for me, it's mostly positionality because of this idea of knowing she came from Canada, but I present myself every day as a Congolese. Yes, I'm Congolese Canadian, but I am living in a refugee community, mainly Congolese. And I speak, I share the, the same ident identity with them. And when I come as just a regular teenager or like, let's say I'm no longer a teenager now. I come as, cause many people confuse me thinking I might be 16 or 17. So whenever I come in front of people, <clears throat> I present myself as a student. And on top of that, I tell them, I'm a young woman, I'm a Congolese, and here's what I'm coming to you about. This is the message I want us to share. And here is who I am. And I had this structure where when you're teaching people, you're standing at the front and the students are sitting or people who are listening or who are supposed to learn something uh, sitting down. Actually, we had to break those barriers. Like we all sit down in cycles and try to discuss about these issues. And when I come to an authority, like let's say local government authority, I come to them as a regular Congolese who comes to ask for help. I stay in the queue. I wait as everybody else and wait for my time. 
And the issue is that whenever we know we have this, the privileges we hold, sometimes we are very egocentric. We want it done. We know we can achieve it. But the best thing that I feel, like I feel good if I went into a community or I went for my uh, awareness session. We had we have it every Saturday with the community, fathers, mothers, girls, and boys. Coming in the community, sitting down with them at the same position, and we don't I don't present myself as a Canadian or a student from Cody Institute or a Pathy Fellow. I just present myself as Danny. I'm a, I was a refugee like you. I am a student and I'm here to learn from you. So I think the positionality plays a big role. And once I achieve that, even when they reach out to me like, oh, where are you from? And I'm like Congolese and I show my identity, which is like, okay, she was born in Congo. And that's it. I could say it's mostly when I feel we are discussing from the same level not trying to be like supremacist or somebody who came from somewhere i think that's what makes me feel better and i could say i'm so grateful that this question came up anyone else to want to add on this uh the next hand i see is jacqueline um for me in my experience um I would I, I want to share a small story about the first time that I entered a classroom um, with one of the teachers where um, as soon as I walked in, every girl stood up and said, good morning, like very rehearsed and um, stood up until I told them to sit down. Um, but after like continuously engaging with the girls, now I feel so much um, I feel so proud of the girls for now leading their own sessions and essentially leading all of the conversations themselves. Like Danny said, sitting in a circle and not in a in a hierarchical um, authority position of students and teacher, um, really encouraging the girls to be engaged in their own learning and to take the initiative to come up with their own ideas. They even, uh, in one of my workshops, uh, classes they even came up with um, hosting their own festival day for uh, sensitization about periods and engaging their male classmates as well as their parents because um, those were the uh, who they identified to to be to not like feel as much support from so for me like being able to see in it like very live actively girls taking ownership themselves and um, that autonomy just growing amongst themselves is uh, is what really makes me um, grateful for the experience and, and know that that there is um, a lot of change happening led by the girls themselves. Thank you, Jacqueline. Any more hands, ja uh, Jenny? Yeah, I think we have hands from everybody. I don't know if we have time for everybody, but we'll... Let's, let's go through it. Let's do it, perfect. Uh, next on my screen is Anthony. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, uh, Danny, I think I really echo kind of like what, what you mentioned here. Uh, I think for me, a, a lot of people actually find it hard to actually believe that I actually came from Canada. So that helps me a lot. Um, people don't actually don't believe it. They, they, um, I, I integrate so quickly, so fast, uh, and everything into the society that it's basically it's uh, people people just find it hard to do just because of the way I act um and I think it's because it's like I don't have a you know even though like I'm more of the technical expert in in the case I don't have a I don't have that mindset that oh like I'm here to help you and and things like that and so that helps in the trust so it helps that I look like them speak the language uh, but it also helps that, you know, even though I, I've lived abroad for so long, I don't have that mindset. And so it helps to be more welcome. So, you know, on as as opposed to, you know, Sophie or Jacqueline, that it's visible for me, it, it isn't. So it, it helps me in that aspect. And I think always attaching yourself to people from the community who can drive a lot of these conversations, especially if they're bought into your idea. Even for me, I don't even speak a good number of the times. I, I actually let like a community people just speak because they know 
and I've sold the idea to to the demo ready and they they are able to do it and most of the times they tell me what to do and I just go and and do it so that that really helps in pushing that trust and they are able to in turn help me open doors especially local government partners that I might not have access to and so being humble in that manner and really engaging with them like you do every other person being yourself is the most important thing that i that is my greatest asset in fact i i treasure it so much so that's it for me being humble uh next one jenny next on my screen is sarah sarah yeah um, I'm going to take the question in a little bit of a different direction. I think, Takafi, you had asked uh, like the impact day in and day out on the community, I think, um, of our initiatives. But I'm going to flip that to kind of to a more personal scale. I don't feel qualified to speak about if my community thinks my initiative is useful at all or not. Um, but one thing that's been really cool for me is the student population that I'm getting to work with. Um, these are kids who live in squatter settlements. They come to school barefoot. Um, their uniforms, their clothing, their food uh, comes from the school. The oldest kid um, in my class is 13, and his four-year-old and six-year-old brother sit in the class with them so he can babysit them all day because his parents are working. Um, and so the demographic of students that I work with are, they are, them and their families are um, not just underserved, but intentionally, I think, ignored by government structures, by NGOs, um, by a lot of the people who are seeking to do good, um, even just geographically in the city where they live, it's very difficult to get to. These slum settings are, or slum settings are uh, pushed over to the side and you wouldn't cross through them on your everyday route uh, anywhere in the city. But they're also only 10 minutes away from some of the more expensive houses where the parents go every day to work um, and they act as servants and, and even the kids. And so I think all this to say that um, the, the school settings are places in which even people from this city, from this country, born and raised here, um, make an effort to avoid these areas. And so for me, it's been so just gratifying, I think, to be able to exist in these spaces and just learn from a demographic of people that I otherwise would never have had exposure to. Um, and I mean, I can only hope that they're finding some value in the mental health education that we're learning together. Um, but if not, I think it's been so transformational for me to be able to hear their stories and, and learn from their resilience, their creativity, their grit, um, and just the genuine enthusiasm they have to wake up every day and come to school um, or just exist, really. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That's, that's very powerful. Uh, is there anyone left, Jenny? Last but definitely not least, we have Sophie. Sophie? Yeah, so I'm definitely echoing what everyone's saying. I'll do like a little resume um, and then I'll touch on my point. But like Danny and Anthony were talking a lot about breaking down power dynamics. And I still think I have a long way to go in that. But it has been something that has made me feel like I have an impact. And just like asking questions, because I am one of the people that's very visibly different especially in my community. Like I haven't seen a white person um, for a very long time. And so I think just asking people questions of why they're asking me has, I've seen had the impact of people asking me less questions for things that I wouldn't necessarily know and coming up with their own answers, which I think is like a super positive, like push in that direction of challenging like a lot of colon colonial narratives that aren't act normally challenged by white people who come in and are also reinforced by the education system where I am. Um, Jacqueline talked a lot about um, community ownership and I definitely have found that in my cooperative, um, well, not mine, the cooperative. Um, they have made their own name. They now lead their own sessions and this was all they're doing and they like have their voice. And I think that was super um motivational for me to keep on going just because I understood that they wanted to do this and it wasn't just because I was in the room that they were doing this that they were like no Sophie even when you're not here we're the ones that are leading it's not through this organization we're doing it it's through this collective we formed um 
Then Anthony also talked about like speaking the language. Um, obviously, Anthony is from Nigeria. I'm not from Malawi and I'm learning very slowly how to speak to Jewa. But that I think, and someone asked a question um, about like integrating and I think it shows a lot of respect um, about preparation. I didn't really know how to prepare and someone told me not to learn the language because everyone could speak English. And that's one of my biggest regrets because I think speaking the language actually shows so much respect and you also gain so much knowledge through language because the way phrases are formulated in Chichewa are completely different for English and they mean very different things. And so I think that is a huge thing of people now wanting to talk to me in that language or wanting to teach me and um, has also break down those power dynamics of people actually feeling like they have things to teach me and it's not just me showing them things that has been really um, fundamental and something I've appreciated and I'm learning a lot from and I'm walking away with. And then Maya mentioned like the gratefulness she, she has for working with these people and when we talk about feminism, um, one of the the misconceptions is it's men versus women. But what I've been um, learning a lot with a lot of different people is that it's about giving this voice to the people who are are often not voiceless. They all have a voice, but it's the people that aren't given this voice. And um, I also have the opportunity, and this is like my highlight of the whole Pathy Fellowship. Um, there's children that come to hang out with me every day. And um, I think like that, just building these relationships and being able to live, leave there with like people I genuinely love and have these relationships with and that I want to upkeep, um, like has me leaving with a sense that like I, I have, there has been some impact in some way that has been positive um, on both sides because it's a, a, a relationship that goes both ways. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are coming towards the end of our session. I could have kept it going for the next couple of days, um, and not just hours. This is fantastic. This is beautiful. And this is very powerful uh, occasion for me and for all of us to listen to your stories. I have one final question for all of you. Uh, your initiatives are funded by once I, I, I pose that final question to you, I will hand it to Eileen to say a few closing remarks and we will end today's session. Your initiatives are funded by um, Pathy Foundation uh, and a generous support from an organization uh, committed to building a relationship and making sure that initiatives are rooted in community spirit and community relationship. I suspect uh, members of that foundation, some of them might be listening in. Do you have a message for them? Do you have anything to say uh, and to share and say, hey, I have something to share with you? Anyone? Sophie, would you like to start? Sure. Um, sorry, I'm a bit on the spot here. Um, Thank you. Obviously, there's a lot of gratitude, but I think like my big message is just like this has been exploring for the future as we're only like a few months to the end. Um, I realize that this is such a unique opportunity in that this is a lot of funding without with a lot of trust. And I think like we've been talking about the traditional narratives of development work. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. There's a lot of there's a lot of like things you have to meet, like statistics you have to provide, you're you're just under stress the whole time. And I think like the trust that this um, fellowship and this foundation has built through this program is, is quite exceptional. And I'd really like to see um, replications um, in this. And it would be incredible if this was um, replicated by a lot more um, organizations. So thank you for giving as youth a voice. Thank you, Sophie. Anyone else? The message for the Pathy Foundation? We have uh, hands from Danny, Anthony, and Jacqueline. First on my screen is Danny. Okay. Danny, go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm so grateful. Uh, if there's one word, I don't think I might have that. The flexibility the fellowship offers it's amazing because if we were set to go 
like any other, let's say, organization. For example, Save the Children, UNICEF, we have a target to reach. Uh, they have some, uh, they have some uh, goals to achieve by this time frame. It would have been impossible because of the nature of what we are doing. Uh, for example, I could take my own initiatives, as I these initiatives. We wanted to start vocational training, like uh, tailoring hairdressing. But coming into this community, we realized we might need to do appreciative inquiry in order to understand what's really happening into this community. What has happened? Who's doing what? And if it wasn't for this fellowship being this flexible, I doubt if we could have reached this outcome that now the initiative is community owned. And I won't say like I I I I I am still waiting. I could say like um I can't wait to see the next cohort to see what they will achieve because I know sometimes we feel like okay, this is the budget and we are short on this. And at the same time, it provides us the opportunity to not only depend on what we have, but actually ask for help. Because currently, like I asked, there is the village health team, which is there is the medical team international, people that are reached out to for their spaces to, to be used on weekends. And when once I told them I don't have the money and they understood. And at the same time, I was grateful that I didn't have that money because if I had it, I would have paid for those spaces. And now at least I know in the future how the initiative will go on even without me using these spaces. I'm so grateful for the flexibility the fellowship offers. And thanks a lot. That's all I could say for today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Next. Uh, Anthony. Well, um, yeah. So, I mean, I would say the fellowship has been very amazing. Very, um, it's been a, it's been, bread, it's, it's, it's changed a lot for me. And so for me, I really want to just say that if we could have like a coalition and even expand things like this into entrepreneurship, because it's everything is so metric focused. And this is the first environment where I've been where it's not it's not it's not metric focused, but instead is process focused. And I think that's one of the things that I really like about it. It's it's not metric, it's process focused. Going into how you feel, what you're doing, how you're engaging with it is very important. And I think the flexibility is one of the most helpful thing but the fact that it's so process focused and wellness oriented allows you to really develop this with a mindset that this is not a pass or fail this is what you do how do you feel day to day making this impact in not just the lives of the people but how they are making an impact in your life in the process thank you next uh, Sarah. Sarah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think uh, initially I feel so privileged to, to be in this position as I'm sure all of the nine of us do. And so thank you for, um, I think, giving this opportunity. I think I'd echo what everyone else said, but I just wanted to add that uh, in addition to the generous um, funding that we have, there's so much more that I think makes this so unique. I think the support of um, Jess, Courtney, Degafi, Sarah, all of the people who kind of are our behind the scenes cheerleaders for the whole thing. Um, their support has just been so invaluable. Um, and then particularly within our cohort and the community building that I think has been emphasized has been so instrumental to um, allowing us to achieve the outcomes that we're all hoping to, to work towards, I think. Um, and so I think uh, just to, again to echo what everyone else said, having one of these programs would be lovely. Um, and just looking at how, as youth leaders, we can uh, look forwards to support other youth leaders um, and to build coalitions and networks um, of you know like-minded people who are also striving to make a small difference in this large world. Thank you. Uh, anyone left, Jenny? And Jacqueline. Definitely. So to, again, echo all of my fellow fellows gratitude, um, I would love to say a huge thank you to Pathy Foundation Fellowship. Words cannot even begin to explain how transformative this experience has been for me 
and I'm sure for um, the other eight fellows. Um, I think in addition to the funding, the amazing support from all of all of the stakeholders here, like our, our facilitators, our resource people, um, all of the speakers that came in to teach us about different um, community building um, uh, theories in FCC in June. Um, in addition to that, I think the amount of hope and um, inspiration that I've gotten from everyone I've been so lucky to work with in this experience uh, has totally transformed my perspective on the world and my direction in the future. Um, and so um, just to shout out my uh, other fellows and then also from alumni that I've been um, connected to, uh, it just, it really gives me a lot of hope for the future, um, seeing how many young individuals are um, are exercising their innovation for um, for making the world a better place uh, in a, a very sustainable way with communities, because it really does start, uh, start small. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say a really big, big thank you overall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I met all of you, as you said uh, earlier, that in June, uh, and most of us met us, and the, the inspiration you instilled in us uh, as we work together for a, a, a better cause and better community building is is the most powerful thing I've ex experienced. And most of you mentioned that challenging hegemony begins with even from a physical sitting arrangement that not hierarchical sitting uh, and and flat uh, arrangement of sitting, and then you guys are challenging uh, hegemony because uh, of hegemony given to you by default that you came from the global north or uh, you come from more advanced communities, so on and so forth. So you have given us hope in this bleak moment of uh, our collective existence. And uh, as uh, one of you mentioned that the next cohort is underway and I hope to see you soon back home here in Canada and to listen more to your experience. Now I would invite Eileen for the last closing remark and we will conclude our gathering today. Thank you so much, Eileen, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you so much, Degafi. This has been great. And um, thank you for moderating such a rich conversation. I, you, you all have blown me away. Um, I'm amazed um, at how much you've accomplished in a very short time. And I can hear the passion for which um, you are approaching the community and the work that you're doing. And as Degafi has said earlier, the relationships that you're building, which are so key, um, and, and, you know, the future is going to be a bright one. Degafi, as we talked about, the world is a, is a very uncertain place, right? Um, and, you know, m there's much to be concerned about. But one thing I'm not concerned about is the leadership that we have in front of us on the screen right now. It's uh, just incredible. Can't wait to welcome you back here. Um, and I'll echo um, what you've said about the, the support of the Pathy Foundation. I mentioned it at the beginning. It's this kind of program is not common um, to put that kind of trust into um, into a program uh, into into Cody Institute for that matter um, to uh, to really allow the space, the the finances um, to um, to be creative, to think differently about development, to approach things in a unique way. Um, it isn't common, and we we are very grateful for the kinds of support that we do get from the foundation. And I shout out again to the Pathy family for who are here today, as well as um, Michelle Ladun and her team who are on the call as well and listening in. And I know they're going to be full of questions for you when you when you do return, and and excitement for what you've accomplished. Um, Cody, as I mentioned, also has a range of youth leadership programs. Um, I, I would be remiss if I'm not uh, also sharing with you that my colleagues Adi Strickland and Alice Sala um, are teaching an online youth leadership course right now, primarily um, also supporting youth in the employment sector here in, in Nova Scotia. Um, we have a youth entrepreneurship program. So Anthony, you mentioned 
entrepreneurship and the importance of that. And, you know, with CNFX, we have a program for CNFX students called Discover, Discover Box, which is also doing some really um, wonderful things for youth. And um, alongside the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, we are fortunate to be part of a new consortium that will also have an international youth internship program, not quite as um, as big as the Pathy Foundation Fellowship, but equally um, an opportunity for, for young leaders to gain experience um, abroad um, working with our partners. But this is really the jewel in the crown for Cody Institute, um, this Pathy Fellowship, and we're delighted that we continue to look at how do we expand it, how do we um, ensure that more um, leaders uh, of today, young leaders of today are, are also brought in. So thank you again to all of you. Thank you, Courtney and Jess, um, for all of your hard work on this program. And thank you to Degafi, Brian, and Jenny for your leadership on this webinar today. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you all.